<laughs> yeah, we're going to um, try and run a live um, web feed in this presentation, so please bear with us. Yeah, I've got some things preloaded, so um, some of the user journey stuff will be slightly different. So, really picking up where um, Kiara left off, um, we start with the assumption, we start with the realisation that never before in our history has it been easier for groups of people to coalesce, to form, to join together to achieve a single purpose. We're talking, of course, about cloud-based computing, um, the network society, super fast mobile networks, the fact that many of us have all got supercomputers in our pockets. It's on top of this infrastructure that a new social, digital and collaborative economy is emerging, creating peer-to-peer -peer networks that have made it radically easier for communities to form and achieve anything that they want to put their minds to. It's nothing less than an open access, random, surprise-generating machine. This is the defining motif <coughs> of our age, of our society. And what we want to put to conference today is the question, what does that mean for archaeology? And how can we harness that for our advantage? We believe we've, put, we've, we've come up with at least one of the solutions to that question. <coughs> and today we're going to introduce to you a software platform called Digital Dig Team that we've been developing and beta testing in the field this summer with our tech partners, LP Archaeology and our designers, Pixel Parlor. Now, this is such an amazingly cool thing. We'll try not to geek out too much about it when we run through the features in a second. Um, but it's basically uh, built on completely open source software. You've heard of WordPress as a content management system for um, blogs. Well, this is a community management system for archaeological digs. It means that we can build an audience for our projects through imaginative and shareable content. We can generate funding for the dig um, through crowdfunding. Um, we can increase participation in the dig through crowdsourcing and build social profiles of everyone involved, no matter where they are in the world. And the crazy cool thing is we can record from site using iPads, iPhones, in fact any device connected to the internet and publishing text, photos, video, 3D models, all in real time, all to a website, all live. Now, we're going to try and uh, run through some of the uh, demo of some of the features of that in a second. Um, but we're also going to try and put that into a, uh, a social context to try and understand what this might mean. And to do this, it's a helpful um, form of analysis that's been developed by uh, Clayton Christensen in a book that he published some years ago called The Innovator's Dilemma. He came up with a distinction between sustaining and disruptive innovations, where sustaining innovations don't disrupt the status quo, but merely help archaeologists do what they've always traditionally done just a little bit better. So <coughs> GPS might be a version of that. A disruptive innovation, on the other hand, allows us to fundamentally reimagine what we do as archaeologists, how we fund, resource, record, analyze and how we communicate our science. So although we think digital dig teams really, really cool, although we think the technology is great, that's not the most interesting thing to us. The most interesting thing to us is that it offers the potential to unlock a social process, to reposition how we do field work. Now that's something we've been aiming for all along with Dig Ventures. Um, we're the first exclusively community focused registered organisation in the newly formed Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. And we describe ourselves as social entrepreneurs. We use creative thinking to develop solutions for social challenges. In archaeology, we could suggest that there are two overarching challenges. The first is that archaeological value must be expanded to express our social and public purpose. And the second is a declining financial capacity for anyone, no matter where they practice, to service these newfound ambitions. We responded to this challenge um, by launching the world's first crowdfunded and crowdsourced archaeological excavation at Flagfen. In 2012, we developed a, a unique approach to public and digital archaeology that we've now rolled out across a number of different sites. Now, of course, crowdfunding is more than just raising finance. 
It's about building deeply engaged audiences. Audiences who don't just want to consume your media uh, passively, but want to feel that they're part of the process, part of the production. And it's pretty much from that realisation onwards that digital dictating seemed like such a logical progression. So what is digital dictating? Well, it's a crowdfunded, crowdsourced and data management software um, for archaeology. It's based on two open source platforms, WordPress and ARC, ARC developed by LP Archaeology. It's both a product and a process in that it's something that we can pick up and drop on top of any archaeological project anywhere in the world. It allows us to create and publish text, photos, videos, um, 3D <coughs> models and publish them live pretty much um, in the instant that they're produced. Um, pretty much uh, from, from anywhere. <coughs> you know, see this is a site map, this kind of it's, it's a conceptual thing, it's uh, something web designers use, but it explains and shows how the two halves of digital dictating work. On the left hand side we have our um, content management system for the archaeological data. Um, it's exactly like you'd expect your paper archive to look like, except it's on, it's on an iPad and it's all on, on top of a networked um, relational database. And on the right hand side we have a content management system that allows us to pull our community um, information together. It allows, allows us to pull our real time um, activity stream, our crowdfunding and our venture database into the same um, same whole. The two things join together and one sits on top of the other. Now the best way to illustrate this is for us to go over <laughs> live and see if we can run through a, a couple of uh, very standard user journeys, Wi-Fi with standing. So bear with us and we'll see what we can do. Okay, so this is our landing page for our um, website. Um, it's very clear what you can do, all of these click through into different aspects of the site. We have a dig timeline that organises all of our content, our videos, we have a videographer embedded with the team, we put a new video out every day, we have a, a community manager writing stories every day, we have vast amounts of social content, and all that lands up in there. But to start with, we're going to go straight into um, the fun side of things, and that's the, uh, the archaeological um, database. So imagine now that you're looking at this through an iPad or a device. And this is completely, this is what, what it would look like if you logged in. Um, let's expand it, close it. Um, it's all, so that's what it would look like if you were on a, a phone. And then if you move that out, that's what it would look like if you were on an iPad. Um, I'm logged in now, I'm a super admin, so that means that I've got all, um, much more functionality. And there are various levels of rewrite access to this. Um, a, a community participant might get just a number of those buttons at the top, the, the advanced search, the browser. But you can see what, what, what it does. We've got various different find records there. If we go straight to context. Okay. So imagine this as your um, context register. There's one of these for every form of record. Very quick way, take a number out, cr crack on with the digging. Um, numbers will be put there, a short description, <coughs> any of those would, would do. Um, and then below you'll see that uh, a uh, list forms exactly as you'd expect in the context register. We're not going to start a new record, we'll just have a look at one um, that's got ongoing. Oh, no, doesn't like it. You could just log straight in. Yeah. Never work with children, animals, or live Wi Fi connections. <laughs> Try again. Right, if you were in the field and you had to work with live Wi Fi connection, I guess. Can you do a solution to that? <laughs> we do. It's in the post. Uh, there will be an app version very shortly that records offline and then dumps all the data after. But, um, okay, so this is what you would see on your iPad. Super cool feature here. Um, remember the back of context sheets used to scribble on there with a uh, by and make something legible and no one understood. Now you can take a photo <laughs> on your device. It will embed there. Now that's not an archival photo, that's um, a sketch photo. We have a whole different set of photos that we take on high-res digital SLRs that become part of the archive. But this is a photo that you can take as soon as you find the feature, during the feature, in fact as many of those as you want. It suddenly means that we can add so much more in information back in, into the record. 
And we have, as you can see, it's very similar to every single um, uh, context sheet that you've ever seen that's based on the traditional molar um, version of things. And that, that's easy to fill in and everything. But of course, not everyone that we work with is a professional and skilled and trained archaeologist. So we have a, a number of levels of help here. We have what we call contextual level help, that's help embedded in the record, and then top level help. <coughs> so if we go to um, scroll down a little. So we go to that, we open that up, see what we've got. Okay, so the way you have to think about this is a, is a molar manual hardwired into a digital context sheet. And that, that gives you the, the impression. Scroll down, down rather. So we can put all kinds of data in this and all kinds of images and everything. If we go now to the very top and look at the top level help. Now we've got help um, categories, as many help categories as we want. We've got these in at the moment. We've got to contact seeing as we're on it. <coughs> okay, so um, this is a uh, much more friendlier version, I guess, than the Molar Manual. Um, we embed videos in there which help explain short one minute videos. So all of this can be looked at um, by a, whoever's recording the feature in the field uh, to, to kind of give them some idea. All our sites come, we, we have various supervisors and lots of train around, so it's not the, the only training that someone would get. This is just to remind them, and of course they can look at it offline when they're, when they're back home or, or what have you. Okay, um, so perhaps if we look, go through search. Um, now, this is all um, sat on top of a relational database. It's extremely powerful. Every single um, record that's made all links back to each other in a meaningful way. So, of course, that we can... Um, that photos, um, if you want to find them, actually. <coughs> if we go to um, objects there. So at the moment we're just going to look at every single find um, that's an object and not a coin. Um, it will be just as easy to run a, a complex search, say, on all worked bone in um, uh, primary ditch fills in Trench 10, for instance. Um, we could pretty much run anything we like through this. Um, there are different ways of, of uh, ordering this. You can look at it as a list version there. You can look at it as a series of tiles. Um, you can look at it as... Um, uh, cards, all kinds of cool stuff that we can look at in that way. Good stuff. So this is the back end. This is the logged in um, version of our digital dig team. Of course, everything is published live um, in real time. So if we go now to see um, the open data, and we can see actually um, what that looks like. So it's back in the browser. Good stuff. So this is what everyone who would visit our website would be able to see, and there are all those different different categories there. Perhaps if we go to find, so have a look at that. Um, and this comes up in a very um, user-friendly um, manner that's um, you know, visually appealing. And um, we could click through to one of those. Should we look at the bone handle on that? Great. <laughs> okay, so as, as well as being able to um, you know, take these things, take really great photos and put all our information in there, we can embed 3D models into our primary record. And we can do that very, very quickly. We can put a work plan in place that means that within hours of things coming out of the ground, we can have, a, have them washed, we can have them uh, modelled, and we can be embedding those in our primary archive. And this, of course, is hosted through P3D, but it's created on really sophisticated um, photogrammetry software. Um, but this is the shareable version that allows us to um, put it out into the world and harness back information from our community of um, supporters. And we can actually start to modify our strategy on the ground. This one, for instance, allowed us to um, modify our, our sampling strategy on that particular feature. We've had examples of those elsewhere that we're going to be discussing in the 3D session um, tomorrow. Um, good stuff. Now, um, if you scroll to the very top of, of this, 
You'll see, of course, actually just spell them a little bit. You see, if we put our share buttons in there, you see, we're trying to engender a conversation around all this material. But we don't just bolt the share buttons on and then <coughs> call it the social. Social's embedded in every aspect of digital dig team. Um, everybody who um, works with us, everybody who supports the project, gets their um, personal profile on the site. And um, we can actually have a look at a few of these now. Do you want to say anything about this, please? Um. Yeah, well, we've, we've experienced probably something that all of you who are on site with volunteer um, archaeologists have experienced, and that they come from really amazingly diverse backgrounds, and that we wanted to capture that somehow um, just by asking people a few simple questions um, about you know what, what they do in real life when they're not doing archaeology, um, why they decided to support our project, and then sort of what they're finding most exciting or what was their real highlight of, be, of being on site with us, which is part of a, a larger research project actually that we're doing, um, which will be out later this year. And we just we just found just a tremendous um, um, spectrum of people wanting to come and, and do archaeology, which, which is great. Um, one of my favorite features about this page, I mean, this is open access, so um, anyone is welcome to sort of come and see the people who have joined up digging with us, but also, um, where is she? We had one volunteer who had a really good season. Yes. <laughs> um, I totally doubled my post ex budget. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> um, and what I really like about this page is that it, through an RSS feed, the records that she actually created on site with us of uh, her <coughs> finds show up. And so this is this becomes part of how Joan Sutherland is visible in the site record for Lace and Abbey. And of course it means that they can check back in during the post ex process and all these records get updated and they, they continue to be part of what it is that, that we're doing. Um, good stuff. So if we look back <laughs> at the um, website, the main website now, um, in addition to the uh, um, social profiles and all the data um, streaming through, um, we've also got very um, uh, uh, some great features there regarding the timeline, but also it's in effect a, um, a current archaeology, an online current archaeology uh, uh, magazine um, uh, synopsis of the site, which allows you know, the average visitor to the website to get a, a deeper understanding of what it is that we're doing without getting bogged down in our um, site reports. Um, is it going to that one? It's thinking, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> So all of these um, sections click through into a slightly more, um, slightly more depth, um, 400 words or so, um, written for the non-specialist, but that which then allows us through Hotlinks to, uh, to, to drill down through that stuff into the primary data below. So it's a very kind of classic ladder um, effect, which means that um, we have all our, our primary stuff underneath our interpretive, interpretive stuff. So it's not really managed to do um, before. As well as that, um, our um, uh, reports, our project designs, these are all published on the website as well. And every time they, um, uh, these are PDFs uh, uh, laid out um, uh, with an every, every single number on the PDF and every single context number can be drilled down into the primary archive um, as well. Um, so it's, it's really cool, it's really effective. Um, every aspect of this, all the pictures that you see, or the titles, but pretty much everything, is customizable to whatever site you happen to be digging. <coughs> so it's a framework that can be picked up and dropped on, exactly like you would with any um, themed WordPress site and, and stuff. Okay, good stuff. Right, uh, back with PowerPoint. So how does this innovation fit <coughs> into the history? Field work. I'm expecting everyone to cheer now. Are we cheering? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just me. Oh. Um, well, in the beginning was the site director recording and interpreting with a site notebook or site diary with hundreds of labourers shifting hundreds of tons of earth. Then, of course, came the rescue revolution, the development of the context sheet and the splitting of the archaeological record into a numbered sequence that could be organised into a stratigraphic matrix. Now this both democratised the interpretation process, um, but it also led to a production line model 
where a physical archive of atoms can be moved from evaluation to excavation to assessment to analysis then to publication. It's a closed cycle that has done wonders for the professionalisation of our industry. We're now embedded in um, environmental risk management. Um, but in the same way it's done that, in actual fact, it's also led <coughs> to a separation of archaeology um, from the public. Just this week, we went to the launch of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, which is a great step forward. Um, but cutting ourselves off from the public isn't a great look particularly when it's being talked about widely that we're now rolling back the state to pre-1930s levels. Now the growth of community archaeology can very much be seen as a response to this trend as organisations turn to the true source of their legitimacy, the great British public. The rights and wrongs of this community <coughs> term are being debated right now down the hall with arguments for the motion ranging from the pragmatic to save us all from the axeman's blades to the principled, all paths are equal and we're all archaeologists now. The premise is that archaeology can't be of value in and of itself, but can only be valuable for some other purpose, social, political or economic. You know where we stand on that one. Um, now archaeology being archaeology, we've managed to construct an entire edifice of theory on top of this, neatly summarised into top-down or bottom-up. In the former, projects can be see, conceived as a staged, managed collaboration between the expert on the one hand and the public on the other, with the expert retaining control. In the latter, the agenda is set according to the needs of the communities themselves, with the expert relinquishing control into the hands of non-professionals. Now, it goes without saying that in this scheme, as this has been formulated, bottom-up, in this equation is considered to be far superior. Now, I'm not really sure how digital dictating fits into this. I don't think it fits into it at all. And as we draw <coughs> this to a close, we'd like to reframe this top-down, bottom-up debate in light of the social and technological changes that are impacting globally pretty much every single world of work. From the emergence of design platforms like Quirky uh, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, MOOCs like FutureLearn, decentralised networks like Airbnb and Uber. The idea of digitally collaborating in peer-to-peer -peer networks to consume, learn, finance and produce is disrupting traditional ways of doing things. Now the top-down, bottom-up model is really challenged by these new developments because it's built on economic thinking designed to account for the allocation of scarce resources um, and the primacy of markets. Unfortunately, the <coughs> digital and collaborative economy doesn't actually work like this. It works with abundance and it works with activity that takes place outside the marketplace. Examples would be things like Wikipedia or open source software like Linux or WordPress. These are tools that are provided to the world for free and the proviso that the community um, improves these services to give back to the community. Now that's exactly what we hope to have accomplished with Digital Dig Team. It's a commitment to continuous, open, um, beta phase archaeology positioned ethically and intellectually within the social contract with as wide a constituency of funders, participants and stakeholders as possible. Archaeological investigation is inherently social and collaborative and by joining the online and offline world so effectively, Digital Dig Team extends that collaboration into how we fund, how we resource, how we record, how we analyse, how we communicate. It unlocks a social process, enabling to us to harvest an unlimited amount of insights from a geographically boundless team. We would argue that this makes the narrowly defined idea of community archaeology an anachronism because all archaeology, to a greater or lesser extent, is practiced by a community. Rather than top-down and bottom-up, in the digital and collaborative economy, the most <coughs> important question is whether you're open or closed. We think digital dig teams radically open. Thank you.